AI, neural networks, machine learning. These are things that lots of people are talking about at the moment. It's not uncommon to see videos about, ooh, AI learns to play snake, or play Mario, or learns to walk, or identify different things. The world of, of AI is pretty interesting at the moment. I'm quite interested in what AI can do for music. Will it replace us entirely, us as artists? Or will it help us in creating even more and better music in the future? Some already very interesting and, and scary examples are creating vocals. And I have over 300 confirmed kills. I'm training guerrilla warfare and I'm the top slapper in the entire US arm. And this is what it is now. In the future, it's only going to get better. So really, I'm just a beginner on the whole topic. But I would like to showcase some of the stuff that I have learnt. I'm not a gifted coder. I, I made a DAW in Excel, but that's about it. I'm not a particularly good mathematician. Neural networks in particular, they use a combination of both. We'll just gloss over the difficult stuff. But I will point out some places that I did learn it from. When you start learning about neural networks, one of like the first cool examples that people often talk about is classification. That's taking a bunch of data, which could be numbers, text, an image, or even video, and classifies what that data actually is. This video here opened my eyes to how a neural network functions. In this example, you are creating a division between two different types of flowers based on two different features. So you can imagine X being the width and X2 being the length of it. So flowers that have a shorter width and a shorter length as well tend to be these type of red flowers, whereas the flowers that are a bit wider and usually longer are the purple flowers. You can quite clearly create a line here in between these two examples so that if you were to add a new flower, it would be safe to assume that this would also be a purple flower just based off all the other ones and where it is. So what's a neural network? Here we have the two different inputs, just like we have the two different features here. So that would go here, width would be one, and this would be the length. And then it would go into this system that does some equations to figure out, oh, this is that type of flower or another type of flower. But what does this do? Maths. Here is one course that I did follow that was very helpful to understanding the pure maths of a neural network. Once you have a brief understanding of it, you don't usually have to know this stuff. There are libraries that exist that just do that hard work for you, so it's good to know it, but not essential for each thing that you do. As a proof of concept, I made my own neural network in Excel, because why, why not? Cool. It did a thing. And then I have another one that this one figures out like the division between the two flowers. Oh, look at it go. Yeah, we're training this. So this is a very popular test using it to classify the different numbers, just like how I was classifying the different flowers. So if you can imagine the network, the output would have 10 neurons, one neuron for each number. So how do you put a number into a neural network? One of the most simple ways would be just to put each pixel as a different feature, each of those pixels would go into one of the neural network neurons. I wanted to do something quite similar with that with audio. All digital audio is just made out of different samples. If we zoom in, we can kind of see this in Audacity. See each little like point is a sample and each sample has a, a value. Some are like positive values and some of them are negative. Yeah, let's do it, let's do that. It's gonna work really well. And the shocking thing is, is that it actually did. If I run this, oh look, it's doing it. And check that out. You can train a neural network, but training it on stuff that's labeled already is not really the end goal. What I want it to be able to do is give it a kick it hasn't seen yet and have it tell me, well, is that a kick or not? So that's what I've done. All these samples at the bottom here are kicks that it hasn't seen. This worked with 100% accuracy. Bass drum is a kick. Yeah, these are all kicks. Not one of these are wrong. It's kind of scary how good this is. Once I started to add more samples, it turned out that this actually wasn't great at all. Oh. The, the difference between a bass drum and a snare is pretty obvious. The kick has wider waves because it's lower in frequencies, whereas the snare is like a lot more bunched up. But what if I added a clap in here as well? They start to resemble each other a little bit more. And I found out that once I started to add in those other samples, 
Ooh. Yeah. It dropped from being 100% accurate to this is less than 70% accurate, which is not great. Oh. It's still getting all the kicks right. It does a great job of the kicks. But then once you start to add snares and claps and train it on those different things, it has a lot harder of a time just differentiating them. But there are, there's better ways of representing the data for an AI than just putting in the pure audio waveform. I, I learned a lot about this from a YouTube channel called The Sound of AI, which I will also link in the description. There's a whole series of this exact problem. And what they did was actually genre classification. And that's what I'll be doing later in this video. So I thought, yeah, let's just use a frequency spectrum instead. But upon further research, they don't actually do that. What's more commonly used these days are MFCCs. What is an MFCC? Honestly, I'm gonna be real here. It's pretty goofy. So we know what a frequency spectrum looks like. You know, here's the audio waves and this is the, the spectrum. Oh, there's lots of low frequencies here and then some high frequencies up there. This frequency here, this is all in Hertz. Oh, you can see it up here, just 10,000 Hertz, 7K Hertz. What's commonly used is a mel frequency spectrum instead. The difference is just how the frequencies are weighted. Here's the normal Hertz scale. That's the one that we all know and use. You can see how like thousand Hertz equates, oh, that equates to a thousand mel, but 2000 Hertz equates to 1500 mel. 500 Hertz equates to 600 mel. So it has a different weighting. The more weird part about this is the septum coefficients. What is that? Well, this is what it looks like. Okay, here's the audio wave, here's that frequency spectrum, here's the the mel spectrum, it definitely looks different. Here's the sepstral coefficients. A trip on the Wikipedia page kind of sends you down an even stranger place. Sepstrum, the concept was introduced in 1963. The terms cufrency, alanesis, sepstrum, and saf were invented by the authors by rearranging some letters in frequency, analysis, spectrum, and phase. Yes, it's just the words frequency, but then moved around, so it says q frequency instead. Operations on Sepster are labeled q frequency analysis, aka q frequency analysis. This is goofy, this is dumb as hell. Liftering, oh, get it, like filtering, but it's liftering or sepstral alana- uh, No, I can't read this. I think I understand it in a really dumb way. Let's just recap a little bit. How do you get a spectrum from an audio wave file? You do this thing called a Fourier transform and it will show you the different frequencies a wave is made out of. Just how you can see, oh yeah, low frequencies and high frequencies and everything in between. How we made a wave go into a frequency spectrum well, imagine if the frequency spectrum was also a wave. This x-axis on a frequency spectrum, that's just the frequency. High frequencies are up here, low frequencies are down there. When we're on our sepstrum, then this is now the q frequency. So all these frequencies up here, the whoa, 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 whoa. That would probably like be your frequency around here. But the overall shape of this sound, you see that, that lump? goes like that, oh, and then it goes up. That shape, I think they call this the spectral envelope. So that obviously is a lot, would be a wave that's a lot slower than, than these, which are like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's that high peak up there. So this, this slow wave, this would be down here somewhere. That would be the frequencies around there. Those frequencies down there, that's what the septum coefficients are. You're just giving that overall shape. This is my understanding of it. I, I think this is right, but Maybe not perfectly explained, but this is how I could wrap my head around it. Okay, here's another image. Imagine that gray line. That's just your frequency spectrum. So you see how it's like, whoa, whoa, going, going up and down really quickly. That's the, okay, they're calling it the harmonic structure. So that's that high peak or high Q frequency. Why is Q frequency in milliseconds? I really don't know. The lower part, the overall shape of the frequency spectrum. That's what's being used to my understanding in the, the septum coefficients. But fortunately, you don't need to do any of the math because a lot of libraries already exist that do that for you. Just loading up a sample, a Labrosa generate an MFCC for you. But hopefully, as you'll see when we test this out, 
This is gonna be way better results. Okay, sorry for the jumbled up order here, but let's look at my overall evaluation on samples that it hadn't seen. Oh, close to, to 90. Snare drum, I already failed on that one. Clap, bass drum, snare, good, 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 good. It got the first one wrong, it got this one wrong, but on average, it seems to be doing a lot better. Then I wanted to move into genres. That was the next challenge. So I put all these different genres in different folders together. So here's some ambient music. Then some classical music. Dubstep. We got 10 hours of dubstep here. So I got all this from YouTube. Searched in dubstep mix. Hours and hours of dubstep here. So I downloaded a bunch of those. And then I got hardstyle jazz and trance, you know, perfect combination. So what's going on here? Here's like a bunch of libraries that I'm using. PyDub is a very good, cool one that I can recommend. It can open up pretty much any audio files. So it'll take two seconds of audio. It'll create an MFC from that. And then it'll go to, go to the next two seconds and then create a new MFCC. Do that all over and over, run that. And you get lots and lots of MFCCs. You get like close to 200,000. I, I do some other stuff, like I, I normalize them. Didn't get into that. I don't think I'm going to because I'm tired of speaking. Yeah, it, it just trains easier when you normalize it. So shuffle them, then I split them apart. So we got the training size and then validation separate. And then the, here's all the AI stuff. Here is where you train the model. So I have Epoch set to 40 at the moment. So that's how many times it's gonna go over the entire training data that you have for it. I have 10 hours of dubstep. If I was to train this 40 times, then that's 400 hours. What if I was to do 400 epochs? That'd be 4,000 hours. Would that be smart to do though? Probably not. There's, you're gonna have diminishing returns. In the beginning, your, your network learns very quickly. And then afterwards it gets slower and slower. So the model I've trained on is very accurate. And remember, this isn't just samples anymore. These are different genres. I put in a Skrillex track, Scary Monsters Nice Sprites. What I'm doing here is I'm chopping up the song into two second pieces, putting that into the, the neural network. It thought this was hard style, uh, but the rest, the vast majority is dubstep, occasionally a jazz, dubstep, dubstep, dubstep. Hard style, it really thinks this part in the track is hard style. It's funny, on, a, on another model that I trained on, it really thought the end of this was all classical. And then I was curious and I went into the track because I, I wanted to hear what the ending was. It actually was like a piano outro. I can understand why the neural network thought that. It's a piano doing do 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 do. Okay, so just for the meme, I trained this for a thousand epochs. You could say that the AI had to listen to 10,000 hours of dubstep, although most of it is just repeated over and over. As you can see by the 80th epoch, the validation accuracy doesn't seem to get that much better and sometimes will even get lower overall. You usually don't want to train a model too much because it will match the training data super well but do an overall worse job at other data that, that it hasn't seen yet. This is called overfitting but that's a whole topic on its own so I'll just leave it at that. Two things I find interesting however, the validation accuracy jumps up quite a bit when compared to the training accuracy and also the training accuracy never goes above 92%. If I could get this higher, then I'm sure the validation and testing accuracy would also get higher. Maybe some of the AI experts in the comments can explain why that is. Maybe the model I created just wasn't complex enough or I'm just doing something wrong. I'm curious to find out why that is as it would only help on getting more accurate results in the future. Anyways, this has been a little side project of mine that I use to procrastinate with. I hope it's been somewhat interesting, even if it doesn't involve anything to do with actually making music. However, as I learn more, I'd love to be able to combine those two things together. Thank you for watching this video. If you ever want to support my videos, I have a Patreon. I also teach music production lessons. You can contact me on my social media accounts if you have any questions. Have a good day everyone.